one of my favorite things to talk about is um, ancestral practice, right? And um, how ancestral practice and layering lives in the lives of our artists um, and really in us, in us all. But I want to cite specifically a moment in Mama Please that um, is one of my favorite moments, um, which is, and we'll play, we'll play a bit of it, but I wanna give a preface just for people who are listening for the first time. And if you, you, you can't hear it like you want to on this Zoom, and trust me, you won't, you'll wanna turn it up and hear it <laughs> somewhere else in a private moment, just to remind you to reflect on on, on this section. So where there is what I call the mama please call to prayers or many calls to many prayers, like in this, this one moment that really captures um, uh, ancestral practice that is cultural, um, that is spiritual um, uh, and that is sacred, right? So our spiritual ancestors and our cultural ancestors, it all at once to me, and you're really, you're, you're calling a praying the word mama right, mama and please. And for me, when I hear that song, that moment in the song, I automatically am reminded of the field songs and Negro spirituals of our enslaved ancestors here in the United States. I'm also reminded of the call uh, to prayer, the Adhan in Muslim tradition and what it means to call the voice and call the community, right, mm -hmm. uh, to remember God. And then also, as you mentioned, Dre, like this sacred practice um, in Black church tradition and in gospel music of what it means to really use the voice as a tool for freedom, right, and aspiration. And then, of course, that, you know, it was George Floyd's last word and his last call and his last prayer, right? Um, his, what we heard in him in his transition, right, from, from this life, his last prayer. So I just want us to listen to this clip of this moment in Mama Please, and then I'll ask you all to speak about it a bit more. So, you know, Drea, I've heard you talk about Mama Please as a song that you wrestled with um, and one that it never felt done until you recorded that moment in between the chorus and when um, Jacory Arthur's verse starts. Um, so especially for me, having witnessed you perform, you as an artist perform live, I experienced so much embodied and intuitive um, ancestral practice and sacred trust in, in the work and in the way that you perform. Did you and do you see ancestral practice as a part of your work as a vessel in this piece in particular? And what was the process like of reaching for that moment, right? Like, did you plan it? Could you have planned it? What made you know that the moment was right or done as you were wrestling with that song? Absolutely, 100%. It's, it's a, and that moment was, was an ancestral practice. That moment, um, at, we had finished the song, you know, maybe, I can't remember, end of June, July. And then we started working on the music video and having, um, you know, sent it to Chikori and got the choir on there. So every time, so we had several versions that was mixed to allow other people to make their contribution. And every time I, I heard it, I, I was like, yeah, well, I just got to do my part over because I'm like, I'm, I know I laid down a, a good foundation for other people to to come and make their contribution. But I knew that I wasn't um, I hadn't offered in the in the way that that felt like uh, true to that moment. Uh, 
I hadn't I hadn't made an offering that felt like I was being obedient to what my spirit was leading me to do. So um we we were recording in a in a different space other than the studio and it was it was a good setting. Um we were out kind of surrounded by nature and it was very late and it was kind of like okay so what part did you want to do Drea like Elijah's like because I'm, I'm about to you know do the final mix of the song so like come on and it was a it, it was not something I was able to verbalize I can't explain like I need to sing like this for this amount of time and in this way I just needed the space to be able to listen better so um so in order to do that, for me to even hear what was in that section, I had to pull the drums out. I mean, the section wasn't there at all. So, but even like before, um, even before the uh, Jacory comes in, that little, I had to create a space before that. So we took out the drums, took out the bass, took out the piano. I had to strip everything down and really just listen to to what was in that space. And what I heard was not only George singing Mama, but I heard almost like all these other ancestors singing Mama too. And they were, it was like, it. the ancestors created a, a chorus and they created a large chorus and they were singing with George when he said Mama. So that's what I heard. And it was like, his cry wasn't, wasn't a lone cry. You know, it wasn't just, it wasn't merely a, a, a lament. I, what was, that's what I was feeling in that moment. It wasn't merely a lamenting. It was actually, um, he was joining an invitation to join in with the ancestors. And I'm studying um, death right now and black death and reimagining black death. And so, as we like the closer we get to that transition point, then I, I do believe, and it's been written in many texts that ancestors do come for us to usher us into the next realm, to the ancestral realm, to what I call home, you know? And I'd like to offer that perhaps he actually saw his mother and maybe he was actually like, oh my God, like mom, like, yeah, please take me with you. Like, take me with you. And I think that that was what was happening. All of, I was hearing all of that. So I had to even create a song on the keyboard that mimic, if you listen, uh, there's no oohs and ahs in the background. It's, it's actually a sound I'm playing on the keyboard that sounds like a chorus to me. So it was important to me to frame that moment as, and then I was thinking about the transition from the spirit leaving the body, going to the ancestral plane and imagining what does that sound like? What does that journey sound like? And I was, I, I really was trying to position myself to, to really hear what that sound was. And that was uh, my intention for framing that section in that way. So many powerful things in what you just said, but one of my biggest takeaways from what you just shared, Drea, was not thinking about lament, but really, or only lament, but also ascent, right? That this was um, this call. <laughs> journey in this transition that had um, more power in it, right? Um, mm -hmm. Just lament. And, and I feel like it's so beautifully captured in the way that that moment crescendos to um, Jacory's verse. So thank you so much for sharing, sharing that beautiful, beautiful insight. Um, Brother Rami, I want to come back to you and ask. Um, so I said earlier, you know, before we listened to the clip of Mama Please that I experienced the layering of so many sacred traditions in this song and, and in, in the whole album, but I'm thinking musically, thematically, culturally. Um, and for me, knowing you, it makes sense um, that your writing has all these layers and intersections of, of various um, sacred traditions, practices and ancestral practices. So I'm just wondering if you intended or did you dream that the, the album would manifest or this song in particular would manifest in these layers? of cultures and traditions and ancestries. Um, how does ancestral practice for you in, 
in, in whatever way it manifests. So I'm not just talking about like our genetic ancestors, right? But our spiritual ancestors, our community ancestors, et cetera. How does ancestral practice and remembrance live in the album for you? Would you say that ancestral love is one of the layers of the love stories um, as you know, love for communities? I'm just would love to hear you riff a bit on the, the layers of expressions of love that you were working on with this piece. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, I think there, there's two layers maybe I want to speak to. Um, one, one, the very personal, again, going back to Jerusalem as this ultimate metaphor. Um, for me, you know, I, I come from a family on my father's side that goes back literally over 700 years in Jerusalem, a very, very deeply Jerusalem rooted family. And you know, at one point, Dre and I were staying at uh, in in the heart of a Hasidic community in Brooklyn, uh, about to record this, and I, it was something so beautifully familiar for me in that hotel. It was run by these Orthodox rabbis, and in that morning, I got up and I was having tea, and there was an Orthodox rabbi reading the text, and. He looked over at me, thought I was Jewish. And we, I said, well, I said, I'm from Jerusalem. He said, I, you know, we, we had this conversation before Drea was coming down and we stumbled on our love, the, our kind of mutual love for Jerusalem and, and this kind of from a very mystical way. And just, I think the idea that there's this ancestral connection of multiple traditions with Jerusalem, this kind of, um, you know, obviously it's been the source of a lot of pain, that same love, but it's also been, you know, there, there are moments where we just talked about this very famous line in this movie, A Kingdom of Heaven, that some of you may have seen, where Salah Adin Saladin at the end uh, is having this conversation with Bailey in the Christian night as he surrenders Jerusalem, and he says this one famous line, what does Jerusalem mean to you? And at one point, he says, Salah Dean says everything. And then he walks a couple feet and he turns back and he says nothing. And so this idea that Jerusalem both is this ancestral symbol of, again, a spiritual lineage and connection uh, to a both very terrestrial space, but also the ability to uh, also recognize that there's something celestial about its connection, its aspiration. I think um, that that ancestral connection to spiritual tradition uh, is something that I think is very deep. But also, you know, you as you hear Drea speak, and you talked about Drea being a vessel and how she collaborates. But I think the other thing I would talk about Drea for me in this entire journey has been guide. She was a guide for me. She wasn't just a vessel, and and I mean that in so many ways. I mean, part of it was. Uh, of course, I already have been unapologetically very, very shaped by Black American spiritual traditions, uh, especially the encounter with Islam and all of the multiple ways in which that is manifested and the fact that it opens up with a prayer. And I think she's on by Layla Muhammad, who utters the Bismillah in the name of the divine, most gracious, most merciful. This is the daughter of Imam Murthy Muhammad, the granddaughter of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, and uh, you know, who has her own ancestral connection to the traditions. Um, for me, the fact that we open with that, uh, the fact that so much of this journey has been what, what you just heard Drea mentioning. I haven't heard Drea articulate that, you know, the, the kind of the hums and, and but it just all always felt right that she opened up that way. The fact that uh, Rani Ma'ali, who I think is on this Zoom, the, the extraordinary, just amazing multi-instrumentalist, the fact that he opens up with, I knew we heard Oud and, the, and, and Rani could talk about the ancestral, you know, origins, the, the fact that the Oud is the genealogical origins of the modern day guitar, uh, for me is also something to have that instrument with the very sacred sound and this lineage uh, combined with the kind of that black church tradition that Drea brings into the, the humming and the pain, the kind of the, the, the almost a hurt that you hear in the very beginning uh, of this album, 
uh, both in its, again, both in its beauty and its pain, I think was important and speaks to ancestral trauma as well as ancestral kind of, you know, resilience, um, which again is something we both, I think, lean into, shaped by and draw from. And the fact that it opens again with all of that was, was nothing we really intentionally scripted uh, as, a, you know, that wasn't, but it all, I think we always kind of just felt it and, and it and it came about that way in ways that felt right. Um, um, and as each layer was kind of brought in, um, I think we all knew uh, when it, you know, it was converging in a way that all uh, seemed to reinforce that larger theme. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. I mean, thank you just for reminding us of how powerful ancient spaces are, you know? Um, and really, I mean, I think that we can kind of take for granted when we hear Jerusalem, but to hear you talk about 700 years, you know, um, and really being able to, to make that connection and to how, um, you know, just kind of um, the power and the inheritance of that. But also the thing that I heard and what you said, or one of the things that I will take away from that is just how ancestral practice recognizes ancestral practice so that we can have you, Andrea and Ronnie in a space, each bringing, right, your own relationship to ancestral knowledge and ancestral practice and that it works. Um, you know, that, that those traditions can be in call and response with each other to create um, a really wide invitation to people who are listening and experiencing. So thank you.